You're listening to the Odds Cast, the original UFC betting podcast that's straight to the point. Hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas and MMA journalist Brian Hemminger, they provide you the absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting. MMAoddsbreaker.com. Don't place your wagers without us. Welcome to the Oddscast, presented by BetDSI. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts odds maker Nick Kalikas to break down this Saturday's UFC on ESPN Plus 24 event, which takes place in Raleigh, North Carolina. If you're unfamiliar with our format, Nick and I will break down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Looking back at our, our last event... Kyle Marley won 0.86 units for UFC 246 on his premium bets after going 1-1. One and one. He also won both of his free bets on Conor McGregor and Holly Holm. Kyle has his bets and fantasy MMA picks available now on MMAOddsBreaker.com. Back to the present. UFC on ESPN Plus 24 features a 12-fight card in total and will be aired exclusively on ESPN Plus this Saturday night. Let's dive right in. Now, kicking things off on ESPN Plus is a featherweight contest between a pair of UFC newcomers in Nate Landwehr, who is 13-2, and two, and Herbert Burns, who is 9-2. and two. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? couple quick shout outs as always before we get rolling here make sure you check out betdsi.eu that's our sponsored sports book they got a great selection of bets for this upcoming ufc espn plus 24 card so make sure you check out betdsi.eu that's a place to go and that's where we're going to quote the updated odds on this podcast as well and of course as brian mentioned check out big marley three's premium picks on mmaoddsbreaker.com just head over to our premium picks tab and uh, just click it, and you'll see the selections available. Big Marley 3 is one of the best cappers out there. He's up over 263 units in the last 20 months or so. The guy's on fire, and he continues to be. So make sure you're not missing out and go buy the guy's selections at MMAOddsbreaker.com. Um, and, of course, getting right into this card should be another solid fight card. Looking forward to it from top to bottom. I think there's going to be some fireworks. Now, getting right into the fight, a really good scrap to start things off for sure because you have stylistically – a crazy matchup. You have Landwehr, which is a striking base fighter that's going to want to look to keep this fight upright against Burns, who, of course, his brother, Gilbert Burns, a lightweight phenom, now moving up recently to welterweight and doing very well welterweight as well. One of the best all-time grapplers in the sport's history, in my opinion, uh, making his UFC debut here as well. So the opening line was Landwehr minus 140, the comeback on Burns at plus 110. And right now what you're seeing over at BetDSI is currently Landwehr minus 119, the comeback on Burns minus 101. So a line to me was appropriately set. Um, it's definitely a pick em type of fight because, again, I mean, stylistically, Landwehr is going to want to sprawl brawl, keep this fight upright. I think he's by far the better overall fighter. I like what I see from him. The guy's tough as nails. He pushes a high pace. He's the type of fighter that's fairly durable. Um, he has that warrior spirit in him. If he gets in trouble, he's he recovers fairly quickly, and he can step it up to another notch when he needs to. Um, and, again, if he keeps this on the feet, Burns is in some serious trouble because I think – that's one kryptonite that Burns has still overall. He's not a complete fighter on the feet. He could definitely get exposed. He's not the caliber of his brother standing up. Not quite yet. He's got a long way to go because we know his brother, again, is capable of finishing fights on the feet as well. He's getting way better in that area. But uh, unfortunately for Herbert, he's not quite there yet. I mean, he's got, like I said, a long way to go to catch up to Gilbert striking. So for me, I think that's basically what it comes down to. Can Landwehr get this fight to keep this fight upright? Can Burns get this fight to the ground? maybe take his back and utilize the submission game. I think more than likely Burns does end up getting the submission here because I think he does find a spot on the ground at some point um, from a mistake from Landwehr and, and gets it done. Uh, but it's not a confident pick because realistically I've been kind of going back and forth on this as well. I know Landwehr is the better fighter, but I just think Burns' grappling is going to be a little bit too much for Landwehr to handle in this spot. So I am going to go with the submission here. I think Burns gets it done inside, of course. Um, if it does – Play out past the first round, though, it is going to get interesting because I think the Landwehr is going to be able to survive and get confidence, and then he's probably going to win the fight. So I think it's going to be Burns early on if he gets it done. So my pick, Herbert Burns. And I definitely feel like Herbert can and will get the job done, but this is a striker versus grappler matchup. Uh, Herbert is definitely more of a a one-dimensional grappler, having uh, competed in uh, 
you know, one FC region. Uh, and Landwehr is a, a very talented striker having, uh, complete competed in, uh, M1 within their uh, featherweight title. So, um, basically if Burns can't take this fight to the floor, Landwehr is going to steamroll him because Landwehr is a, a, a very good striker, very heavy hitter, aggressive striker, uh, moves forward, really, uh, slings the, the right hand hard, um, and uh, if Burns isn't able to handle that, then I, I can definitely see him getting overwhelmed. This is a very winnable fight for Landwehr. It's just Burns is a very talented grappler, just like his brother, and if he does get this fight to the ground, which most likely would be if Landwehr's swinging wildly or if Burns just times the takedown properly, then I think it'll be all she wrote. I would expect Burns to get the submission, so... Uh, I'm going to say Burns gets the submission here. I think it's at some point, especially early, uh, Landwehr is going to be overly aggressive and Burns is going to make him pay. So uh, Burns is going to be my pick. But again, if uh, Burns doesn't show up, uh, this one could look real bad. But Burns is my pick for now. Now dropping down to the Bantamweight division, we have Brett Johns, who is 15 and 15-2, taking on Tony Gravely, who is 19 and 19-5. Now, Nick, what's the MMA Oddsmaker's perspective on this one? John's open minus 215, the comeback on Gravely, at plus 175. That plus 175 did not last too long. Right now, what you're seeing over at BetDSI is currently a pick exactly, minus 110 either way. So John's minus 110. Gravely minus 110, exactly pick up type of fight. Everybody coming in on Gravely early on. I get it. I understand it. I mean, the guy's making his official UFC debut, but I'll tell you what, this guy is one of those experienced fighters outside of the UFC that's faced decent competition and has performed relatively well. Of course, he's coming off of a contender series win as well. That's how he got his shot in the UFC. Um, and Gravely is a total package. I mean, he has everything. He's got speed and power on the feet. He mixes in wrestling quite well. He's got good grappling ability. So this is going to be an excellent fight. And I understand again, why a plus 175, everybody kind of came in that way because Johns has struggled with complete fighters in his own right. I mean, I think Brett Johns is an outstanding fighter. I think the, probably the overall community is coming in a little bit too hard on him. I know he lost to Munoz and Sterling as of late, so he's on a two-fight skid. He's been out a little while, so I think people are kind of dropping his stock a little bit too much. Brett Johns is an extremely talented fighter, and those losses are kind of top of the food chain to me, so this is actually a step down. Even though I think the Gravely fight's definitely a threat, and it's going to be a competitive fight, I still don't think Gravely's nearly the caliber of fighter that Munoz is, or I should say Johns has recently faced in Munoz and in Sterling, so I honestly think this is going to go back and forth. I think Johns is going to win several exchanges, whether it's on the feet or the ground, um, in scrambles, I think Johns can get top position, possibly take Gravely's back. I know Gravely's pretty good at scrambling himself, so this should be a fun fight. But with all of it said, I think it's a dog or pass situation. Um, and now that Johns is actually at minus 110, I, I think he could actually make a case to be slight favorite as well. So maybe not quite at the opening number um, that it was, but still you can make a case for Johns being a slight favorite. So I agree with Johns in this spot here. I think that Gravely is going to hang with him and it'll be a competitive fight, but I just think Brett Johns is going to be a little bit too much too soon. I think he's going to be just one step ahead of Gravely as the fight progresses on. And I expect it to be a close one, but, and probably hits the scorecards with that said, if not, I could see Johns maybe possibly submitting Gravely. I mean, Gravely's a stud on ground, like I said, but Johns does have ways to win this fight even inside. So the pick for me is Johns. I think he bounces back and gets a much needed win over a very game fighter in Gravely. Yeah, Gravely is a very talented guy for making his uh, UFC debut here. Um, I was really impressed with that uh, slam knockout that he picked up in CES, winning the Bantamweight title against Cody Nordby, and then he follows that up with uh, a few more finishes before uh, getting a really impressive Contender Series finish to earn the UFC contract. So... You know, this guy absolutely deserves to be here, and this is, I would say, a well above average UFC debuter. That being said, Brett Johns was a player at 135 before he ran into Aljamain Sterling and, and Munoz. So, yeah, he's not elite, and uh, he'll get beat by the best of the best, because Munoz and Sterling are both, uh, Sterling's definitely top five, and Munoz is right there on the fringe of the top five. Uh, in the Bantamweight division. So there's no, 
you know, there's nothing wrong with losing to them. So I'll say uh, as long as Brett John still has that hunger that he had uh, before he obviously got those uh, back-to-back losses, then I think that he'll bounce back fine. My main issue is, you know, he hasn't fought since June of 2018, so I'm a little concerned there. But as long as he bounces back, he gets this fight to the floor, uses that really strong grappling that he has, then he should be in good shape. Um, if if he doesn't show up, if he's slow, uh, Gravely is a good athlete with a lot of power, especially for 135 pounds. Uh, Gravely could punish him on the feet. John's is a decent striker, but I think Gravely is definitely the more dangerous striker of the two. So I would think John's needs to get this to the floor quickly. But if he does, I think that he's going to be in good shape. So I'm going to side with uh, John's. I think he gets the job done, but... If he's slow or rusty, Gravely could definitely take advantage. This is definitely not your typical UFC newcomer. Uh, Gravely's a guy that I think will stick around in the UFC for a while. But uh, this is definitely a tall order uh, taken on somebody of Johns' caliber in his UFC debut. So I'm still going to stick with uh, the pikey Brett Johns. Now sticking with the Bantamweight division, moving over to the women's side, we have Sarah McMahon, who is 11-5, and five, taking on... Lena Landsberg, who is ten and four. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Landsberg opened minus one fifty. The comeback on McMahon at plus one twenty. My, how things have changed! And right now, the current betting line is McMahon minus one fifty nine. The comeback plus one thirty two on Landsberg. So line did flip appropriately. So. I mean, McMahon honestly opening up as a betting underdog is kind of crazy to me. Even if Landsberg does pull this upset off at this point, uh, you know, she should never open up the um, the underdog here. I understand McMahon has definitely struggled in her last few fights. I mean, you know, it's unfortunate because the sky was a limit for her. I mean, we really thought that she would be a legit, um, you know, potential title holder at one point or a title contender and be right in the mix because she had that – elite caliber wrestling that she brings to the table. Her boxing's gotten a lot better as well. So she's just an elite level athlete, strong, I mean, explosive, powerful. But the problem is, of course, like every other, you know, fighters, female or men, I mean, father time catches up to all fighters and McMahon is definitely not in the prime of her career right now. She's had some tough opponents. She's taken a little bit of a beating. She's been submitted as of late as well. So there's not the best things going for McMahon at this point. So I, I get it. I understand. And Landsberg, on the other hand, honestly, I don't think she's been better. She's kind of one of these journey women fighters that's been around for a while as well. Got her shot in the UFC, made the most of it despite uh, losing, you know, to Cyborg, of course, so that was expected. But I think she's really turned some heads because of the way she fights. She brings it all the time. She's durable. She's tough as nails. Um, she has an outstanding clinch game. And again, I mean, she could really put it on you. If you take her lightly, she could definitely, you know, surprise and open your eyes as she has as of late as well. So there's a lot to like about Landsberg, just a tough, savvy vet. And I think she does have some advantages over McMahon, especially if she could keep this fight off her back and upright. Uh, she could do some damage, but that's the thing here. I think people are severely underestimating Sarah McMahon, uh, her caliber. I think she's just a level above Landsberg overall. She's probably going to get the takedowns. I don't want to say fairly easy, but I would be surprised if she doesn't get top position, utilize some ground and pound, maybe even look for positional control and uh, look for submission wins because McMahon does have the ability to finish fights on the ground, despite people saying that, you know, I've heard people saying she's not a big threat on the ground or whatnot, but she has the potential to win this fight on the ground for sure before it hits the cards. If not, if it does hit the scorecards, I still think McMahon is probably durable enough here. She won't get caught up in a submission. I'd be surprised if she gets submitted by Landsberg here in this spot. So I think she's going to be durable enough to hang on and, and grind out a win on the scorecards as well. So my pick is McMahon. I think people are underestimating here, her here in this spot, um, and I think she's going to kind of bounce back strong here. And I think she can still be a player at 135 pounds. So my pick is McMahon to get the W here. And I completely agree. McMahon is a talented fighter, and her biggest issue is she's, while she's a great wrestler and she likes to take fights to the floor, she is not particularly great with submission defense. So if she takes down someone that has a good ground game that can tap her out, they're usually going to tap her out. Um, You look at uh, people like Ketlin Vieira, Marion Renault, if... Sarah McMahon puts herself uh, on the ground and gets caught. She's going to get caught. Um, So I will say that being said, Lena Landsberg really does not have much of a ground game. 
Uh, Landsberg is a decent striker. She has uh, you know some quality boxing. She has uh, she's strong in the clinch. She's good with elbows. She can be dangerous as long as the fight stays standing or if she's in top position. But in this fight, I don't see Landsberg getting top position on the ground against an Olympic caliber wrestler. And I think McMahon should be able to get the fight to the floor. Uh, and while it is standing, McMahon is not a terrible striker. She doesn't have that much power, but she's a capable striker. So as long as she's uh, punching with conviction and gets Landsberg to go along with her, there's going to be openings. And if McMahon shoots for a takedown, I don't see Landsberg having the takedown defense to stop her. So I would expect that McMahon gets top position and then McMahon has the potential to you know, steamroll Landsberg on the ground. She can have some pretty heavy ground and pound if she can uh, find some space. So I'm going to side with Sarah McMahon here. I think that Landsberg just does not quite present the stylistic matchup that McMahon can be threatened by. So my pick is going to be McMahon. I think that she probably wins a decision, but potentially could get a, a TKO or even a submission along the way. Now again, sticking with the Bantamweight division, moving back over to the men's side, we have Montel Jackson, who is 8-1, and one, taking on Felipe Calaris, who is 9-1. and one. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Jackson, minus 700. Calaris, plus 500 was the opening line. And right now, what we're seeing over at Bet DSI is currently Montel Jackson, minus 667 to come back on Calaris at plus 474. So line markers have tightened up a little bit. Basically staying about a 7-1 to favorite, just under 7-1. to um, it, It's tough to bet this fight, obviously. I mean, Montel Jackson is one of these guys that, I mean, the hype is real. And, and he's one of these fighters that has quite a bit of hype surrounding him coming into the UFC. And, and from what we've seen thus far... I mean, it's hard to argue that this guy is not going to be a potential title contender one day. I mean, I think he's a total package. He has everything that you want to see in a fighter. Outstanding on the feet. He's got crisp, clean technique, only getting better. Utilizes a long reach over most of his opponents well. He has outstanding wrestling. He's got good takedown defense and really good ability to grapple on the ground as well. Now, of course, he did... You know, unfortunately for him, have a setback in his official UFC debut. Um, it was kind of a surprise defeat in a way. I mean, Simone is, look, he's a phenomenal fighter in his own right, of course. We know that. So that's not necessarily a bad loss, but he was able to utilize some wrestling and just basically be a step ahead in that fight against Jackson and, and get a solid win. But outside of that, he, Jackson's bounced off bounce back nicely against Kelleher, of course, at Sukhman Todd, and then, of course, now he's facing um, a very tough fighter and game fighter in Kolaris. So this is not going to be an easy fight for him. I think Kolaris presents a lot of problems. A lot of people don't respect him uh, as much as they really should in this spot. I, I would not lay 7-1 to um, on Montel Jackson here or even close to 600 or whatever the spot may be here because I think you're taking too much risk. Kolaris is a very aggressive fighter. He brings it. I mean, he's got decent wrestling. I don't think he's going to be able to out-wrestle Jackson here in this spot, but he does throw with some serious intent. He has hard leg kicks close that gap and wants to kind of grind you out a little bit and again every punch every elbow every strike he throws it's with some power so Kolaris is not an exactly an easy fight here um, for Jackson but I do think Jackson again is going to be a step ahead I think Jackson regardless of where the fight takes place in this matchup is going to be able to uh, basically beat Kolaris I think he beats him on the feet I think he out wrestles him here in this spot as well I think he's good defensively jujitsu wise so I understand why he's a solid favorite I just would not bet this fight at this spot here so it's a pass situation for me I think Kolaris is definitely a good fighter. It's, he's just biting off more than he could chew in this spot here. So I do understand why Jackson's a solid favorite. It's just high enough for me to stay away at this point. So my pick is Montel Jackson to win. I'd be surprised if he does lose in this spot. And I like Montel Jackson as well. I mean, this guy is clearly a really talented fighter. He earned the UFC contract on the Contender Series. And while he had a, a slip up in the debut, he has been rock solid ever since. Uh, that win over Kelleher looks even better after what Kelleher just did at UFC 246. Uh, and then he looked great against Sukumtad as well. Um, so Jackson seems like he might have the complete package. This guy has power. He has length. He has athleticism. He has submissions. So, uh, you know, Nick saying that he could be a, a player at 135, even though 135 is right now one of the most talent-rich divisions in the entire UFC roster, it's not hyperbole. 
Like, Montel Jackson could be a player. So this will be a good test for him, though. Uh, Felipe Colares is a talented fighter, uh, 9-1. and one. His only UFC loss was in his Octagon debut. And then he's turned around and got a win in his next UFC fight. So he's he's going to be sticking around a little bit. And uh, Colares is a talented guy. He has uh, some decent boxing. He's got some submission ability. Um, Colares is going to be a little bit smaller, I believe. Uh, he'll be a little shorter. He'll have a little bit less reach. So uh, that being said, Jackson, I just think he has that complete package if – He's able to land that big shot. I think he could potentially submit Kolaris. I just really believe in Jackson. My only concern, potentially, is if Kolaris can put Jackson on his back. Um, we haven't seen him since the, the Simone loss, uh, how he performs on the ground uh, when he's put in a bad situation like that. So uh, I'm a little concerned there, but other than that, I think Jackson can pretty much control this fight. So uh, I think Jackson gets the job done. I, I think he can probably win by knockout. So uh, my pick is going to be Jackson by knockout. Now dropping down to the women's flyweight division, we have Justine Kish, who is 6-2, and two, taking on Lucy Pudilova, who is 8-5. and five. Now Nick. Where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Pudilova opened minus 150. The comeback on Kish at plus 120. And right now what we're seeing over at Bet DSI is currently Pudilova minus 169. The comeback on Kish at plus 141. So line margins have tightened up a little bit as well. A little bit more action coming in Pudilova's way. There has been action on Kish, or there is two action hitting the sports books, depending on which spots you're betting at, of course, as well. Um, and I think we'll continue to see two action here because this should be another ladies' fight that's fairly competitive. I mean, most female fights seem to be, especially at this level, um, they kind of bring it. You know, both ladies here are going to want to stand and bang. I mean, Kish does have that kind of pace and that pressure in most cases that she likes to push. Pudilova is going to be game, and I think Pudilova obviously has a little bit of reach. She has an advantage. I think standing up overall, I think she's definitely the most diverse, the more diverse striker of the two. I think she has a devastating clinch game, and I think she's going to do some damage. I mean, Kish eats a lot of punishment. Pudilova kind of absorbs a bunch as well, so this is going to be interesting because I think both ladies can get busted up here and kind of just go after it, but I think the concern here for me in Pudilova's defense would be her ending up on her back and maybe Kish getting top position and kind of grinding her out a little bit or pushing her up against the cage and trying to slow this, make this an ugly, grueling type of fight. I think that's kind of Kish's path to victory here, where Pudilova, I think, wants to keep this fight upright, utilize that length again, even in the clinch, and just kind of make this an all-out brawl, all-out war, what she loves to do. And uh, I think she'd get the W that way as well. So I've been kind of going back and forth on this one as well. Um, I do lean with Pudilova. I think there's more upside to her game. I think she continues to improve, and I think she's going to continue to head in the right direction, where I think Kish has kind of plateaued a little bit. She's had some time off now. I'm just not sure what we're getting with Kish. I don't think she's showing any improvements, in my opinion, where Pudilova is definitely taking her game to the next level. So I expect that to continue here. So I'm going to go with Pudilova in what should be another close barn burner type of fight, but I think Pudilova probably gets it done. Yeah, my main concern here is Justine Kish hasn't fought in over two years. Um, and combined, these ladies have lost five straight fights. So, you know, there's really, they're not going to be the most reliable. Um, Pudilova had a brief stretch there where she was getting a few wins, but uh, since dropping down to 125, she has not really impressed that much. But the one thing she has going for her is she's young. I mean, even though she's been fighting in the UFC for a little while now, she's still just 25 years old. Um, Kish, on the other hand, is 31. Um, in terms of skill sets, I would say that Pudilova is the better striker of the two. Uh, Pudilova is the better athlete. Uh, Pudilova will be a little bit bigger and stronger, I think. But Kish probably has a little bit better wrestling. So it'll the way this fight plays out is I think Pudilova gets the better of Kish in most exchanges. It's just, will Kish be able to take Pudilova down, and will she be able to keep her down? Um, that's really going to be the story of the fight. Um, I mean, other than that, uh, I, I, I'm definitely concerned about how Kish performs after such a long layoff. Is she going to be... Uh, is she going to have issues with her conditioning? Is she going to have a slow start? 
uh, how rusty is she going to be? Uh, because in terms of like striking ability, Kish is probably in terms of uh, significant strike percentage and everything. She actually does. Uh, she's a little bit better offensively, but she just does not quite keep up with Pudalova's pace. Um, and then obviously uh, takedowns. Uh, Kish has decent takedown accuracy at 30%, and Pudalova does not have great takedown defense. It's okay, 64%. So really, it's just going to boil down to can Pudalova stay off her back, and can Pudalova outwork Kish? Because I think uh, Kish is just going to be a step slow, and you know she's just underperformed. Uh, I, I thought that she was going to be a player in uh, the the women's strawweight division, and then I definitely don't think that she's going to be you know much of a contender or player in the women's flyweight division. So uh, my pick's going to be Pudalova. I think that she's going to be a little bit better this time around, and she's improving hopefully. And you know I really don't expect to see much new out of Kish at thirty now that she's in her thirties. So my pick's going to be Pudalova. Now, moving up to the featherweight division, we have Arnold Allen, who is 15-1, taking on Nick Lentz, who is 30-10-2. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Allen up in minus 265 to come back on Lentz at plus 185, and right now what we're seeing over at BetDSI is Allen minus 270 to come back on Lentz at plus 216. So line marks have tightened up a little bit for sure. Again, two-way action coming into this fight. I know a lot of people, the popular opinion is going to be Allen here. I agree with it. I think the kid's an absolute stud. He only gets better. I think that he's kind of coming along at the proper pace, and he's getting matched up relatively well, I think. is I mean, you know, they're kind of bringing him along, taking the right steps. And I think Nick Lentz is another one of these proper steps that he's taking because Lentz is such a – veteran of the sport, such a good, durable overall fighter that, you know, he's, he's been in there with some of the best. He presents a lot of problems to most of his opponents because of his complete game. I mean, the guy, you can't sleep on his stand-up skill. He's got some power on the hand, with his hands and his feet, really. I mean, he's got underrated kicks to go along with good wrestling. And of course, that nasty guillotine choke that he has as well. So Nick Letts is a threat in most places. Now, of course, he's been in, you know, the octagon so many times that he's definitely been um, through some wars and, you know, he's not in the prime of his career, of course, at this point. But that said, again, I think he still presents enough problems that this is a good test for a guy like Arnold Allen in his career. I think Allen is coming along relatively well. I think he's tightening up that t- takedown defense pretty solid. I think on the feet, he's starting to get a little bit more confident. He has clean technique. He utilizes usually a little bit of reach over his opponents, and he knows how to use it. Um, I think he's a precise accurate striker as well, so I think in this spot right now, the timing is well for him to get Nick Lentz in this you know, in this fight because I think Lentz is going to struggle getting this fight to the ground, and I think he's going to get beat up here against Allen on the feet as well, so Allen has to definitely be careful. He doesn't want uh, Lentz sinking in a guillotine or maybe taking his back or anything like that. He wants to keep this fight upright, keep the distance, keep his timing, keep that accuracy going, and just kind of land those shots. And I think eventually things will add up to a clear win for Allen here as well. So I think Allen could possibly finish Lentz inside the distance at, before it hits the scorecards. Or if it hits the cards, I think Allen will do enough to outpoint Lentz as it goes as well. So I do like Allen in this spot. You know, at the current price, as far as the betting value goes, under three to one, I understand if you're going to throw Allen or parlay or so, but it's kind of, you know, at that point right now where you do definitely have to respect Lance. So I don't think there's a tremendous amount of value on Arnold Allen. I think you got to sit back, watch this fight kind of play out and enjoy it because I think it should be a good one. But my pick is going to be Allen to get the W here. And I'm right with you. Realistically, the only thing holding Allen back from being a, a top player in the featherweight division is the fact that he just hasn't been able to fight consistently. Uh, he's been basically fighting about once a year, but it seems like he's finally put those woes behind him. Uh, his most recent fight was uh, this past uh, July, and then he actually fought in March before that. So he had his first two-fight year, I think, ever in the UFC, uh, and now he's fighting again right right around here in January. So to have three fights in ten months, that's huge for him. Uh, and he's he's right there. He's... He's got the grappling, he's got the striking, he's still young. Um, This is a very talented fighter and somebody that is ready to make the move. So I think uh, 
Allen should be able to handle what Nick Lentz presents. Lentz is a talented wrestler. Lentz does have a good guillotine choke, and he can be aggressive on the feet. So uh, Allen can't obviously underestimate uh, Lentz because if he leaves his neck out there, uh, the could get guillotined, and if he screws around too much, he could get ground out in terms of uh, Lentz's wrestling, because Lentz is a, a pretty strong, powerful grappler, especially at featherweight, which was where he was at his best, and where he uh, got close to making a run in the 145-pound division before moving back to lightweight, and it looks like Lentz is returning to featherweight after about five or six fights at lightweight. So we'll see how his body reacts in his mid-30s now, uh, dropping a weight class again. But uh, I think Allen gets the job done. I just think that he is the, the, the more well-rounded fighter of the two. And at being so young, he's adding more and more to his game every time we see him. And especially with Lentz, not just dropping a weight class at 35 years old, but coming off of a TKO loss to uh, Charles Oliveira, um, he might be a little bit vulnerable. You know, this is a guy that used to be able to take a punch pretty good, but um, Allen might be able to run through him if uh, you know Lentz can't handle the heat. So I'm going to side with Allen. I just think that he has all the momentum right now, and as Nick said, he's getting Lentz at the right time. Now moving up to the middleweight division, we have Bevan Lewis, who is six and two, taking on Daquan Townsend, who is twenty-one and nine. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Lewis opened minus 350, the comeback on Townsend at plus 275. And right now, what we're seeing over at BetDSI is Lewis minus 435, the comeback on Townsend at plus 333. So line did get bet up a little bit. Man, Bevon Lewis is such a talented fighter. I mean, he's honestly been disappointing, to say the least, thus far in his UFC career. I mean, a lot of people were expecting him to be – you know, there's comparisons, maybe possibly the next John Jones, you know, but a middleweight here. I mean, that's the kind of physical attributes a guy has, the kind of technique, the kind of potential he has, really. I mean, the guy is definitely a skilled fighter in all areas, of course, coming from the Jackson's camp, uh, Greg Jackson camp as well. I mean, just like I said, a lot of similarities, but he's underperformed. I mean, he was doing pretty well in that fight against Uriah Hall and then got blasted. And that chin is definitely suspect because even though he's, that was his first setback, I mean, he's definitely been rocked, you know, in, in fights and at times you got to be careful with him. And I think that de- decision loss in his last fight to Stewart woke up a lot of people as well. I mean, Darren Stewart is definitely a, an improving fighter. So I don't have, even necessarily think that that's a bad loss, but it's definitely kind of a stain on his resume right now. Um, in order, f- from what we all expect him, at least, you know what I mean? We just expected so much. We didn't expect him to lose to a, a game fighter like Stewart. So two setbacks in a row here. I mean, he must win this fight against Townsend. If he loses to Townsend, then you could forget about it. I mean, there's no way uh, Lewis is ever going to be considered a, th- a serious threat. He might even you know, lose his roster spot here in the UFC if he loses this fight to Townsend. So there's a lot of pressure on Lewis to get this fight done. I think he will. I mean, he's just a more talented fighter everywhere. I don't think Townsend presents the, quite a threat uh, as Stewart did or as Hall did in this spot. I mean, he definitely has some power. He's a savvy vet as well. He's very experienced. You cannot let your guard down. And if, if Townsend lands on Lewis, I mean, he could definitely hurt him. Again, I, that's my concern with with Lewis is he's a bit chinny, and he needs to tighten up that defense a little bit more. But overall, this is a winnable fight for him. He should be able to excel in every area across the board here in this fight as well. I think Townsend is dangerous, but Lewis is just far superior here. So I understand it. He should win. Now, will I trust that chin and lay over 4-1 to one in this spot here? No, I wouldn't do it. I'd pass. I do think he gets it done, and I don't blame you guys for throwing him in parlays because I expect him to win here. And like I said, it, I'd be shocked if he loses to Townsend. I mean, he almost deserves to get cut if he does lose this spot. Um, but that said... I hope Lewis bounces back and he starts showing what he's capable of because the guy really does have some awesome skill across the board. So the pick is Lewis for me to get it done. Yeah, Lewis, as you mentioned, has been such a disappointment so far. He had Uriah Hall on the ropes and then ended up uh, allowing that come from behind TKO and then uh, the Stewart loss, which, like I, like you said, wasn't the worst loss in the world, but he definitely should have been able to, to win that fight, but just got outpointed over the course of three rounds. So if that same Bevan Lewis shows up, you know, Daquan Townsend could walk away with a huge upset victory. That being said, Townsend is stepping in on short notice for Alan Amadovsky, and 
Townsend just is not really UFC caliber. I mean, this is a guy that was kind of brought into the UFC to be lunch for uh, Dalcha Lungiambula uh, way back in June. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, the fight was... Uh, you know, mildly competitive, but then he got blasted uh, in the third round. Um, you know, Townsend is a little bit more of a, a journeyman type fighter. He's really not UFC caliber. I think his biggest win of his career is probably like Hector Urbina. So, you know, give credit to him for that. But other than that, I'm not really expecting much. You know, Townsend has some power, but I don't think Lewis gets knocked out by him. Uh, Lewis just needs to show up, take this fight really seriously, take it just as serious as he did against Uriah Hall, and he should be fine. Um, he's the better striker. Lewis is the better grappler. Lewis is the better athlete. Lewis is younger. Um, the only thing Townsend has on him is experience, but it's really not experience against elite fighters other than his last fight uh, where he got knocked out. So I think Lewis should take this pretty easily. So Lewis is going to be my pick, and hopefully he doesn't disappoint us again. Now moving on to the main card in the light heavyweight division, we have Jamahal Hill, who is 6-0, and taking on Darko Stosic, who is 13-3. and Now Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? Stosic open minus 126, the comeback in Hill minus 104. Right now, what we're seeing over at BetDSI is Hill minus 123, the comeback on Stosic plus 103. Excuse me. So line flip, Martin Sapp tightened up, and there is two action in this fight, and it's about a pick em fight. Man, I'll tell you what, this is a tough one to bet as well and a tough one to pick because Stosic has so much power. I mean, the guy – Definitely brings in is a threat. I mean, he's proven that his leg kicks are something that you have to deal with. When he's throwing, he throws heavy, he throws hard. They could do damage. They could be effective. He's got big power in his hands as well. So the guy is definitely somebody you got to watch out for. Again, I know there was hype and buzz coming into his UFC debut, and, and he hasn't really performed up to that hype quite yet. Outside of that win, you know, he, he went out there and smashed Kimball. But a lot of people don't respect. No offense to Jeremy Kimball, but they don't kind of respect Kimball in that regard and then suffering the two setbacks that he did even though they were competitive fights or whatnot a lot of people are disappointed in Stosage let's face it so he needs to bounce back here and get a solid win over a very game opponent Hill Hill another one of these contender vets um, that actually looks really good I mean he's definitely a promising up-and-coming fighter of course um, I like his athleticism he's a southpaw he's gonna have some reach in this spot here as well he's got that killer instinct so I think you know the more I dug into Hill to be honest with you the more I like about him in this spot here as well I think these guys um, we'll go back and forth, and they were definitely a good test for each other because I think they could present a lot of problems. I mean, Stosic is definitely going to be the, one of the hardest hitter, hardest hitters and most dangerous opponents that Hill's ever faced. Um, but likewise, I think even though Stosic, there's some similarities, I guess, as far as some length and some reach um, in Stosic's last fight with Hill in this fight here. But I still think Hill is a little bit of a different fighter, um, and I think Hill is going to present some different problems. So I actually been, again, another spot that I've been floating back and forth. That's why Pick is almost really appropriately set in this spot here. But I actually like Hill. I think his athleticism, he's going to be a little bit faster. I think he's going to be able to kind of pick uh, Stosic apart a little bit, but he definitely has to be careful and cautious about the return fire coming back the other way. So interesting, intriguing test. I am going to lean slightly with Hill, though. I think he probably gets a win here. And I'm right with you. Hill is just a tremendous athlete. This guy has a ton of power, really impressive fighter, and uh, I was very – pleased with his performance on the Contender Series uh, against uh, Popic uh, back in July that earned him his UFC debut. And uh, Stosic, on the other hand, you know, this is a guy that I think came into the UFC with a lot of hype and got that first win against Jeremy Kimball, and people thought that, you know, he might be, you know, a, a player in the light heavyweight division, but back-to-back -back decision losses to uh, Devin Clark and, uh, and Chek Wu have really slowed down his momentum quite a bit. So uh, I'm definitely starting to uh, you know, not really be a believer in Stosic. And Stosic still is powerful. He's still dangerous, um, you know, coming with from that uh, Serbian judo background. Um, and he's still young, so he could add more to his game. He could improve, but 
Uh, I just feel like there's something missing there. Uh, and Hill, on the other hand, is just really, really nasty. I mean, this guy can hurt you. Uh, if he can get top position, he's dangerous. Hill's dangerous in open space. Uh, Hill's dangerous just about anywhere. Um, and he can win uh, decisions. You know, he can he can push you the distance. Um, and Stosich, on the other hand, I think if he gets pushed, he'll wilt a little bit. So I think uh, Hill can win this fight just about anywhere. As long as he doesn't get clipped, he should be in good shape. So uh, I think Hill makes that UFC debut a success and walks away with the win. So Hill is my pick. Now, dropping all the way down to the women's strawweight division, we have Hannah Seifers, who is 10 and 3, taking on Angela Hill, who is 10 and 7. Now, Nick, where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Seifers open minus 135, the comeback on Hill plus 05. No respect for Angela Hill, but the betters out there kind of straighten everything out here. Hill is now minus 175, or minus 179, rather. The comeback on Seifers at Bet DSI is plus 147. So minus 179, plus 147, and line opened, Seifers minus 135. So needless to say, everybody coming in Hill's way. I think they're on the right track, honestly. I know, again, another ladies' fight that's going to be competitive. Seifer does have some skill on the feet. I just don't think it's going to be enough. I think Angela Hill is the better striker on the feet. I think Cypher's best path to victory here is probably getting this fight on the floor and exploring, possibly taking Hill's back and, you know, rear naked choke and, and maybe messing around a little bit on the ground and trying to beat her that way. But um, I do expect us to be competitive everywhere, of course. So it'll be back and forth in the state of MMA judging, as I say again, holy cow. I mean, honestly, you know, we're coming off of a UFC 246 questionable split decision, you know, lost to another female fight that I'm kind of still hung up on a little bit. I thought Aldridge and Mazo was a great fight, a tremendous fight, but I thought Aldridge got that. So another spot like that, I'm bringing that up only because, I mean, women's MMA, a lot of competitive fights, you just don't know which way the judges are going to go, especially if they're close, which the Mazo Aldridge fight was. I expect the Cyphers Hill fight to be here as well. So you can't trust the judges. Um, and you know, it's hard to get a finish. I think these girls can probably withstand, um, and not get finished by each other here in this spot as well. So more than likely it does probably hit the scorecards. And if so, I think he'll probably outpoint Cyphers and gets a win here. So if not, if it's going to be inside, it might be Cyphers pulling off, like I said, a submission win, but I still think Hill's improved enough in this spot to get the win over Cyphers. So my pick is Hill to get it done here at the betting window. It's kind of tough because I think all the early action coming in Hill's way kind of straighten out this line and I expect Hill to win this fight so I think it's kind of appropriately set where it's at right now and it's tough to bet um, but I do pick Angela Hill to get the W here and I agree uh, Angela Hill is she's been around the UFC for a while now and she's picked up a few quality wins along the way uh, Cyphers on the other hand you know UFC debut did not go well uh, getting smoked by Macy Barber but uh, she definitely rebounded with those uh, wins over Viana and Esquibel. Um, that being said, I think Angela Hill, while not quite barber level, is uh, still a very talented fighter. I mean, Hill's been in there against some of the best fighters that the UFC has to offer at 115 pounds, like uh, Jessica Andrade, Nina, Nina Ansaroff. Um, she's been in there against uh, Zhao Nin Yan. So... Definitely Hill Rose, she faced Rose, so um, she definitely has been in there against the who's who of the women's strawweight division, and she's picked up quality wins along the way as well. I think, uh, you know, the, the win against Rose was good, Yoder was good, uh, Livia Souza back in uh, Invicta was a very quality win, and she looked excellent in that last fight against uh, Carnalossi, so I think... Uh, you know, and people really didn't give her a lot of respect heading into that fight, and she proved uh, some doubters. So I think this time around, uh, Hill taking on Cyphers, Hill should be the better striker. I think Hill hits a little bit harder on the feet. Um, main issue is, can Cyphers get her down? Can Cyphers get top position? Um I think Hill should be able to, to keep the fight upright. Uh, she's a good enough athlete. Her takedown defense is improving. It's not amazing, but it's good enough. And I think that she does control distance pretty well. And as long as she is able to uh, keep the fight upright, Hill should be able to get the win here. Uh, Cyphers is a pretty dangerous fighter, and she is uh, somebody that you can't take lightly. But... 
uh, I do think that she's beatable, and uh, Hill definitely has the skills to, to get the job done. So uh, I'm going to side with Hill. I think she outpoints Cyphers over the course of three rounds and wins a decision. Now, moving up to the flyweight division for men, we have Jordan Espinoza, who is 14 and 6, taking on Alex Perez, who is 22 and 5. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Perez opened minus 280, the comeback on Espinoza plus 220. That line's been shot up all over the place. It bounced down a little while. Then bounce back up. Now over at BetDSI, you're seeing minus 256, the comeback in Espinosa, plus 208. So line's kind of settling around two and a half to one or so. Again, probably a fair market price for sure. This is going to be a tough fight. I mean, Alex Perez, in my opinion, is definitely one of the better fighters at 125 pounds flyweight in the flyweight division for sure. I mean, just the skill set that he really has across the board. I mean, the guy's not small for the weight class, so he's got that power. He's got that size. He's got that wrestling. He's got that a knockout power and the technique on the feet to go along with it as well. So this guy is really a tough out for every fighter across the board to the point where I think he can make a realistic title run. That's how talented Alex Perez is. I mean, he could definitely compete, uh, I think, for the flyweight title one day if he continues to kind of trend in the direction that he's going here. Um, but in my opinion, that setback to Benavidez was kind of a head scratcher. I understand Benavidez is fighting for the title, and he's been one of the all-time greats, whether it was bantamweight, flyweight, of course, as of late with Benavidez. I mean, that's where he's made his name um, at 125. But he's just one of the all-time greats in the lighter divisions, period, when you, you're dealing with Benavidez. So that loss isn't necessarily a bad one, but it was just very strange how it all played out. I know he got caught, fighters get caught. It just, for me, it just doesn't build well. I think if you're going to be the caliber that I expect Perez to be, I mean, that is definitely something that you have to kind of head, scratch your head about and, and just not overlook at least. But that said, you know, he's bounced back nicely and, you know, got the win over De La Rosa, of course. And now he's in another tough fight um, with Espinosa. But I think it's a, obviously a winnable fight for him here in this spot as well. So Espinosa is going to give him everything he can handle, though. He's very game. I mean, he's got good wrestling. He's got explosive power on the feet as well. I don't think this is going to be an easy fight. I think Perez is definitely going to get tested here. But this is a fight he can edge out as well. I mean, Espinosa did show you know, some weakness in his last fight. It, it was unbelievable how he got submitted by Schnell. I mean, I think that was really bad at fight IQ. So that doesn't sit well with me uh, for Espinosa, honestly. I mean, I wasn't shocked the way it played out. If you're going to, you know, jump into a, a position like that with a, a fighter with a jiu-jitsu that Schnell has, that's definitely not the best uh, IQ you could have here. So hopefully Espinosa, if uh, his IQ shows up here and he's a little bit smarter, because I want to see this fight play out. I would love to see an exciting three-round war back and forth with these guys. But that said, I still think Alex Perez does find a way to edge us out. I think he is a better fighter of the two, and I expect him to get the nod even if it does hit the card. So I do lean that way. I just wouldn't bet it. I think a lot of people are really um, confident in Perez at this point. I do expect him to win, but where the price is now, if you got in – Below 250, I, I get it, but right now it just kind of has makes me hesitate a little bit because I think Espinosa is going to be game. So I expect Perez to shine to get the W here. It's just watch where you're betting it. If it's a 250, I think it's about right. So kind of step back and and just take a look at it and watch this fight as well. So um, it should be a fun one though. My pick is Perez. And I think Perez could get the job done as well. Espinosa is a talented fighter. He's a good athlete. He has. Uh, good physical attributes, just, man, he makes some dumb decisions. I mean, that last performance against Schnell was just head-turning, or head-scratching, uh, diving into a, the, the submission. So, was not pleased whatsoever with his performance there. I really thought that he could win that fight if he just kept it standing, or potentially if he just held top position without leaving himself so exposed. Um but going in there against somebody like Perez, who has uh, a very dangerous ground game, uh, Perez also is pretty talented on the feet. He can uh, do some damage with his hands, as you saw in the, the Jose Torres fight. Um, so I'm really concerned. Uh, I think, uh, honestly, Espinosa has a very good chance of getting stopped again, whether uh, it's with... Uh, Perez's power or Perez's submission ability. Uh, he hasn't picked up a, a submission yet in the UFC, but but before he came to the UFC, uh, he did have some uh, darts chokes. He had an anaconda choke. Uh, this is definitely a guy that is well-rounded and dangerous. So, in my opinion, uh, Perez can get the job done. 
and uh, you know Espinoza. I just I definitely just lost a lot of faith in the guy. So um, that being said, if Espinoza rebounds, um, he could outwork Perez over the course of three rounds. It's just I just don't think he can do it. I think at some point he's going to make a mental mistake and Perez is going to capitalize and either land that big shot, potentially put him out, or potentially submit him. So my pick is going to be Perez. I think he wins by finish. Now moving up to the co-main event of the evening in the welterweight division, we have Rafael Dos Anjos, who is 29-12, and 12, taking on Michael Chiesa, who is 15-4. and 4. Now Nick... Where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? RDA opened minus 215, the comeback on Kiesa at plus 165, and right now what we're seeing over at BetDSI is RDA minus 263, the comeback on Kiesa at plus 211, so line marks have tightened up. Um, Dos Anjos is getting the action from the betters, of course. I mean, stylistically, how does Kiesa win this fight for most people? I mean, across the board, again, RDA is just clearly better than Kiesa. He's a better striker. There's no question about it. Um, I think he's a better jiu-jitsu practitioner overall as well. So what typically Kiesa has an edge with his grappling skills over most, he shouldn't really have that against RDA either here. But what he does have is some size, and he does have that wrestling, and he does have that grappling that I just mentioned that kind of should be neutralized here by RDA. But I think if there's a path of victory for Kiesa, it's definitely getting top position, trying to grind RDA out. I don't think Kiesa is going to have success submitting RDA, but if he's going to make this an ugly fight and kind of hang in there and be tough, because that's what he's going to have to do. RDA is going to be landing some bombs here in this spot. He's precise. Again, he's by far the better striker. So on the feet, Kiesa is going to be eating some shots while he's trying to get this fight to the floor. Um, and then he's probably going to be in some serious trouble along the way when he does that. So it's hard to believe that RDA loses the guy like Kiesa. But what I'm trying to tell you guys out there is that there is kind of a path to victory for Kiesa. If he does pull it off, it's because it's going to be his ground game that does it. So that's the intriguing part here because I think Kiesa is definitely a big guy for the weight division. Of course, RDA, a former lightweight, they filled out nicely and he's competed well, obviously at 170 pounds as well. But I just think Kiesa's size and his ability overall and what he does best getting the fight to the floor and uh, choosing to grind out and not grapple his opponents is definitely intriguing here. And we're going to see if that kind of plays out in his favor. But overall, I kind of hope not because, again, RDA is just such a better, more complete fighter across the board. I mean, you know, if he just loses to a guy that wants to grind him out and, and makes it an ugly fight, that's kind of going to be sad. But that's his path of victory, like I said, for Kiesa. So for me, where it's at right now – it's probably, believe it or not, a dog or pass situation. I can't lay the chalk on RDA here, even though he's, like I said, head and shoulders above Kiesa across the board in, in most skill sets. I just think that Kiesa's size and his ability to grind people out and, and do what he does best is still going to be a problem here. So it's dog or pass, um, but I am going to pick RDA to get the W here. And yet again, I am agreeing with you, Nick. Uh, Rafael Dos Anjos is the more well-rounded fighter of the two. Uh Definitely in the stand-up. Uh, Chiesa is an elite grappler, very good uh, wrestler. If he can get somehow on Dos Anjos' back, I'd be nervous. But other than that, uh, Dos Anjos has him just about everywhere. Uh, Dos Anjos has uh, the better hands. Dos Anjos has the better kicking game. Dos Anjos pushes a better pace. Dos Anjos is better defensively. He's better offensively. And Dos Anjos also is a tremendously talented grappler. Now, the last time I underestimated Chiesa was uh, when he took on Benil Darius when he was at lightweight, and uh, Darius dominated him in the first round, but the second Darius slowed down, uh, Chiesa actually outgrappled him and ended up submitting him. So um, Dos Anjos cannot take... Uh, Kiesa lightly because if uh, Kiesa does get his neck or something, you absolutely could get submitted. So, uh, that being said, uh, Dos Anjos is so talented here, and I just really admire the well-roundedness of his game, and while Kiesa has impressed me, um, especially with uh, the move to 170 pounds, I just don't think that he has the ability to outwork Dos Anjos. Dos Anjos just doesn't really have that many holes in his game. Uh, uh, maybe an elite, elite 
wrestler, you know, like a Habib was able to take him down, but uh, for the most part, uh, or, you know, he got outworked by uh, Covington, but uh, I just don't think that uh, Kiesa has what it takes to, to stop him here. Uh, it seems like only the very, very tip-top guys are usually able to beat him, whether it's uh, you know Tony Ferguson, Covington, Usman, uh, most recently, yeah, Leon Edwards. So, Dasanio has been beat, but I just don't think that Kiesa has uh, that same level. Because so far, Kiesa has beat uh, Carlos Condit and Diego Sanchez, and uh, both of those guys have you know, I hate to say it, but they're washed up. Uh, so uh, there's just not nearly that same level. And I definitely feel like Dos Adios has a little bit more left to prove, for sure. I don't think that he'll become the, the champion at 170, but he's definitely going to be somebody that's going to be tough to beat for anybody outside of the top five in the welterweight division. So... My pick here is going to be Dos Anjos. I think uh, he can win it pretty much any way he wants, but uh, it's unlikely that Kiesa gets finished, so I'll say that Dos Anjos wins a decision. Now, moving on to the main event of the evening in the heavyweight division, we have Curtis Razor Blades, who is 12-2, taking on Junior Dos Santos, who is 21-6. Now, Nick... Where did this fight open, and how has the public shifted things so far? Blades open minus 185. The comeback on Junior Dos Santos at plus 145. And right now what we're seeing over at BetDSI is Blades minus 263. The comeback on JDS coming in at plus 211. So line marks have tightened up. More action coming in Blades way. Tell you what, man, you guys better hope that Blades gets the takedowns here because if not, Junior Dos Santos is declining chinny kind of undependable at this point on the feet type of uh, fighting style could still upset blades because he's by far the better striker here. I'm just saying that off the rip, but of course, I mean, again, timing is everything. Blades has looked like a beast. He's by far one of the best wrestlers in the heavyweight division. I mean, the guy is dominant what he does best. Uh, you know, he's never looked better. Honestly, I, I understand that he lost in Gano for the second time. Just stylistically, that's kind of a nightmare matchup for him, it seems. You know, I mean, Ringano hits like a truck, and it, of course, it just, you know, in that second fight especially, didn't really get to play out that long. But outside of that, I mean, Blades has proven time and time again he, how he destroyed Overeem is very impressive because that's another, I don't want to say an exactly comparable fight, but I'm just saying Overeem is an outstanding striker with usually really solid takedown defense and capable of just giving wrestlers fits and blades went out there and did what he did. So um, that's phenomenal. Again, Hunt, another one of these legendary heavyweights that he was able to just take down and, you know, do what he does. So, um, and we'll have his way with him. So I think that blades is that type of fighter that's really peaking right now, mentally, physically, everything about him's definitely coming into play. His power on the feet is something that you definitely have to respect. Even though he's not a great striker, he is getting better in that area. Um, so I think JDS has to be careful, you know, wherever the fight takes place, but he's going to want to look to stuff takedowns here, want to keep this up, and he's going to want to try to land on that suspect chin. If there's a kryptonite to Blades game, it's definitely that defense, and I don't know if it's fair to say he's got a suspect chin. I mean, again, those losses were to Engano, but that said, you know, he is hittable, he does get rocked, and I think Dos Santos, if, if he's got anything left, it's definitely that old man's strength, and that's an ability and confidence that he knows he can put people down with that power, so... I'm going to play devil's advocate here, and I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park for Blades necessarily, but it's hard to pick against him here. I get it. I understand it. I just don't want to go crazy and bet this fight at the betting window either. And a lot of people are putting Blades in parlays. I get it. I understand it. I do think he, he wins this fight. I'd be surprised if he doesn't. But still, I don't think there's any value where the line is right now. So I'm going to stay away from it. I am going to pick Blades to win. I think GADS is kind of you know at that spot of his career where we're not going to see that his best days. They're obviously behind him. And I think Blades is getting better, and he's on the rise for sure. So he's a legit contender. This is a big spot for him to get the W over a former champ and a huge win to kind of solidify, solidify himself as a true contender here in this spot. So I think Blades is legit. I'm going to go with him to win this fight. Just be careful out there if you're betting it. I'm right with you. 12 for 12. Uh, Curtis Blades is going to be my pick. Um, yes, Junior Dos Santos potentially could win a, a stand-up fight here, but you know, how often does Curtis Blades screw around on the feet with people? 
Um, you know, he, he had Shamil Abdurahimov, took him down, beat him up. Had Justin Willis, took him down, beat him up. Overeem took him down. Hunt took him down. That's just the name of the game when it comes to Curtis Blades. This guy is a very tough-to-stop wrestler. The only person that's been able to stop him has been Nganu, and Nganu is just an absolute freak of nature. Um, and Nganu also obliterated Dos Santos as well. So, uh, basically, you know, you can't blame Blades for losing that one. You know, I mean, Nganu's pretty much been unstoppable except for Stipe Miosic. So... Uh, this time around, it's just going to boil down to Junior Dos Santos' takedown defense. Um, Dos Santos typically has shown good takedown defense. The only person that has really been able to take him down and beat him up at all has been Cain Velasquez, and those took a lot out of Junior. So uh, that's definitely a, a concern because you know he definitely just really took a beating in those fights against Cain. But uh, that being said... Uh, when he keeps the fight upright, he can be dangerous. I mean, you saw it. Uh, against Tui Vasa, he looked good. He, he bounced back after eating a big shot against Derek Lewis. Again, he bounced back after eating a big shot um, and was able to, to come back and get second-round TKO victories. So, Dos Santos is still dangerous, especially if he can keep this upright, but I just, even with his pretty solid takedown defense, I don't think he'll be able to keep it up, right? Uh, Curtis Blades is a freak, as Nick mentioned. I mean, the guy has, uh, even though they're both 6'4", Blades will probably be about 30, 40 pounds heavier than Dos Santos. Blades has the reach. He's got the leg reach as well. So I just think he'll be able to get out there, get a hold of Dos Santos, drag him down, and just start going to work. Um, and Blades' chin unless he's facing Nganu, has been very good so far as well. He's it's held up against some of the biggest shots that anybody else has landed against him. Uh, you know, Mark Hunt landed a monster shot, and Blades just ate it, bounced back, and took him down. So I think that Blades will be able to survive a big shot from Dos Santos and then get him on the floor. And especially with this being a five-round fight, I think uh, it's only a matter of time until Blades has Dos Santos on his back and is getting a TKO victory. So my pick is going to be Curtis Blades. I think he wins probably in the second or third round. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC on ESPN Plus 24. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOBPremium on Twitter because that's where we'll post them first. We can also notify you of our free bets via email alert if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsBreaker.com and we'll add you to a free bet mailing list. Special thanks to BetDSI. Good luck everyone and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this weekend.